every day I, I leave since then is like a bonus day. And I was so close from not being here anymore that it makes you realize how beautiful life is. When the news broke last week that Roman Grosjean will test a Mercedes Formula One car at Paul Ricard next month, there was only one person we wanted to have on the show this week. It had to be Roman. Welcome to Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Now, Roman's been on the show before, back in September 2018. But a lot has happened to him since then, and most notably in the last six months. That accident at the Bahrain Grand Prix, which made so many headlines around the world, still looms large in the memory, and he continues to struggle on a daily basis with the burns he suffered. But you can't keep a good man down, and to the surprise of many, myself included, he's continued to race, this year embracing a new career in IndyCar, his only nod to self-preservation coming in the form of deciding against contesting the oval races. Roman was in remarkably candid form when we chatted last week. He was happy to discuss everything from the horrors of the accident in Bahrain and the impact it had on him and his family, to his new life on the other side of the pond in America and Formula One in 2021. And of course, we talk about that huge opportunity to drive a world championship winning Mercedes. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Now there's a familiar face. Roman, how are you? It's lovely to see you. I'm doing very good. Thank you very much. And which part of the world are you in? Are you stateside? Are you Europe? What's going on? I'm Europe, actually. I was supposed to be in the States this week. We were going to test to go testing in Road America, but um, it's Wisconsin, it's up north, and the weather can be a bit chilly. So we've postponed the test to June 2nd, and therefore I had one more week at home. Hey, that is a wonderful racetrack. But isn't it interesting how you've gone from racing for an American team in Formula One to racing full on in America? I know. It is quite crazy if you think about it. And both of my highest podium finish in Formula One are Canada and USA. So there is something with me in America. It was meant to be, wasn't it? Have you always wanted to race in IndyCar? Well, I always watched it. And, you know, when you travel in Formula One, you've got so many Grand Prix that you, you do follow a little bit what's going on. But I had the impression that it was mainly oval based and then few circuits. And I didn't look it seriously until quite late last year because I was convinced that was the case. You know, I knew Simon Pagenaud, won the Indy 500. I knew all about that, but I knew there were some cool street circuits. But I thought it was like over, over the road. And then once upon a time, a street circuit. And then I... I I checked the calendar and I'm like, oh, okay, that's quite different from what I thought. And even before the accident, I wasn't, I don't know, I've never tried, so I cannot say it's bad ovals, but I, I just, it is f so far different from what we have in Europe. I wasn't really attracted by it. And therefore, that's why I didn't look earlier. But now that I'm in there, I can tell you one thing, the circuits are really cool. They are cool, aren't they? Have you got a desire to do the Indy 500 or is it a no-no with ovals from forever? Well, let's say never say never. Because last week, the guys were racing in Texas and I was very moody. <laughs> you wanted to be there, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, you're racing a championship and then you see the guys racing and you're not there. And then the Connor Daly start, cross the start, well, start line upside down and Mario tells me, do you see why? And I'm like, oh, that's not going to help me, is it? It's a hard sell when you see something like that. But... Um, do you think Mrs. G will relent? Do you think she will let you do is, is it her that's stopping you? It is it's more like a team decision, you know. Last winter we we had a we thought about many things and uh, we need to do that as a team decision where everyone feels comfortable with what we do. And for now we we went to that you know step where I do all the, the road and, and street circuit, but I don't do the ovals, and that's something we felt comfortable with. In the future, if I have the opportunity to be in one of the biggest teams, uh, fight for the championship, things may evolve. But again, you know, I've only done two races, only five months from Bahrain 2020. So, you know, time will heal a few things and we'll see what's happening. But uh, for now, it's uh, definitely a super speedway to know. 
Tell us a little bit more about this team decision, because I think a lot of people listening to this will find it astounding that you've continued racing at all. Yes. I mean, you know, if I if I announced that I was going to retire from racing, everybody would have understood. And, and I guess many people would have taken that decision. But, you know, I, I told my own, I said, look, Formula One, my chapter is closed and I've had a wonderful time and did things that I even didn't even dream of doing when I was a child. I've gone to the end of the, the story, but I say motorsports, I'm not done. You know, there, there are many things I want to do. Le Mans 24 hours. Why not go to a Dakar rally one day? Obviously, IndyCar was on the radar. I've got more in me and I want to compete more. And the man that my kids like and my wife loves is the man that also goes racing and, and has that adrenaline that, that I need to have to be who I am. And I guess uh, that was quite clear for all of us. Is that what it is? It's the buzz, the adrenaline. That's why you've come back for more. I would say it's even more than a buzz because, you know, the adrenaline, you can get it by doing many things. Is that passion uh, that I have for for racing, that uh, competitor, that you know, that little kid that I was, that absolutely hating losing, I still hate losing. It's tough to tell my kids that losing is not that bad, you know, when you know how bad it is. <laughs> but it's just yeah, competition, passion for racing and and racing cars, and that's what I want to keep doing. And is the passion still burning as bright? in IndyCar as it was in Formula One? Or are you, are you a little bit more mellow now? You know, I think the last couple of years in Formula One were quite tough. We didn't have good tool to play with. It wasn't the most enjoyable ones. So I'm, I'm happier now than I was when I was in Formula One. You know, I get to racetrack and I know I can compete for good position. Even though I'm in a small team, we can, we can do great things. And you get that buzz that you go into the weekend thinking, yeah, if I, if I do good, I'm going to be on a podium. And that hasn't happened for, for some time, but mainly the last two years, I would say, in Formula One. They weren't easy to, uh, to cope with, but um, yeah, I am, I'm enjoying it. You know, whatever you do when you're a competitor, a go-kart race to a Formula One race, you just want to win. Tell us about the difference in the cars, Formula One IndyCar. At the end, they're both racing cars, uh, but obviously Formula One has got an incredible technology uh, around the cars. The downforce of the Formula One car is, is stunning compared to Indy cars and all the technology on board. You know, when I sat in, in the Mercedes and the W10, you can, you can see all the details and it, it's just incredible. Whereas in Indy car, it's a bit more like a Formula Two car, I would say, more simplistic but um, less aerodynamic sensitive, but you can also make the car to your liking, which is great by moving the, you know, the roll bars, the roll centers, the dampers, the springs, and so on. And you actually have got a, a very good mechanical grip, which is quite key in the circuits that we do with IndyCar. Because at the end, there are a few high-speed corners, but the key is really the low-speed corners. So that was learning how to drive the car. is quite different from Formula One. Obviously, I would say 40% less power. As much as that. That's interesting. Yeah, it is It is quite big. I mean, Formula One is 1,000, if no more, and IndyCar is 600 and something. I, I don't have the, the exact number, but let's say 650, even though, you know, we're talking almost 40%. And the tires, no blankets. So I just need to be careful when I leave the pit. But then really good tires. You can just push. And the, the way you race is, is very different. It's just... From lap one to lap 100, most of the race, the race track is so short that we go to 100 laps. It is flat out. And, you know, there's no management, no tire management, no, not so much fuel. Sometimes you try a bit the strategy different, but it's just absolute sprint racing. And in that aspect, it's quite different, but um, very physical and very enjoyable. Are you having to do something different behind the wheel? Are you having to drive in a different way are you, are you having to learn new things yes the driving style is very different from formula one to indycar and i can easily understand why some of the u.s drivers are struggling a bit in europe just because the way you drive the car is is very different and i guess for a european driver to adapt to that style is probably easier than the opposite way around and you know there there are some incredible talents up there super fast driver super competitive but yes, the, the, the way you drive the car is, is quite different. And uh, first day I jumped in the car, I was driving Formula One style. 
it was all nice and steady and smooth and easy going, but it wasn't fast. <laughs> you have to rag it a little bit more. Yeah, and then you, it's it's more of a fight, you know. You 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 really push hard and and you can slide and 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 that's the way you go fast. Tell us a little bit about some of the driving talent. Let's talk Colton Herter. He won the race at St. Pete. And funnily enough, when he won the race, there was immediately quite a lot of talk about could this guy come to Formula One? And I think he went on record as saying as part of the Ferrari uh, Academy, he would think about it. Do you think he could cut it over here? I mean, he's, he's definitely a super fast driver. He could have a definitely a chance. He's, he's young. Uh, he's, he's learning fast in IndyCar. But again, they are a very opposite world within doing the same thing. Some may like it, some may go and, and absolutely be fine in Europe, but I can understand in terms of culture, it's a shock in terms of driving. It, it is very different in that aspect. You know, I'm not sure if the, the, you know, some may do it, but some may just not do it. And you, you could tell, oh, he's a bad driver, but he's, go he's good in the US. Yes, but you need to look at the bigger picture. Roman, of the guys you've raced over there, who is the most impressive? Well, I'm going to surprise you, but for now, I would say Scott McLaughlin, the Australian V8 Supercars champion. And he, and he got on, um, on the podium in Texas race one, didn't he? Yeah, it's his first over race ever. Finished second. And even on, on road course, he's been on it. You know, he's in Penske team, so he's one of the top team. He's got incredible teammates. Uh, Joseph Newgarden, Will Power, Simon Pagenaud. So you can learn a lot from them. But knowing he comes from V8 supercars to single-seater and that he's capable of, you know, knocking in a top 10 at the, the road or street course and then go on a podium in ovals, I'm amazed. Do you think the driving style is similar, though, between a V8 supercar and an Indy car? I know one's a touring car and one's a single-seater, but in terms of, you've already said you have to ragged you can't be too smooth and i wonder if there are similarities there probably and and you know one thing is that indycar is has got some aero downforce but it's it, it's nowhere near formula one so all the aero part of it it's it's important but it's not as important as as it is in formula one so i guess in that aspect you get a little bit closer to a touring car but still i mean it's it is a very different car and you know they go fast for the circuits they were using if you listened to last week's episode with Monisha Kaltenborn, you would have heard me talk about how Charles Tirrett have been helping me smarten up my wardrobe for the new F1 season. I got far too comfortable during the off-season, not needing to wear a shirt every day and sometimes not even getting out of my PJs. But I can't get away with wearing my scruffs on camera or in an F1 press conference. And I'm sure many of you have felt the same during lockdown, especially if you've been working from home. But what happens now that we're starting to venture back out into the world? Well, don't worry, because Charles Tirrett have a huge range of high quality, smart and casual wear, which is perfect for nipping down to the pub with your mates or if you need something a little more formal for the office. Their Ludgate shirt, for example, is smart enough for me to wear in the F1 paddock, but comfortable enough for me to travel in. And I can see why they're 100% merino wool zip neck jumpers. Mmm, lovely. Are a bestseller and mine has had way more use than I'd imagined it would in not so sunny Barcelona this past week. I think I'm going to have to get one in every colour. And our good friends at Charles Tirrett are giving you the chance to try Tirrett today. With an introductory offer, our listeners can enjoy shirts from only $24.95 and knitwear from $29.95 with a six-month guarantee and free returns. Just use our code GRID24, that's GRID24, at ctshirts.com or in store. Right, let's get back into it with Roman. You've touched on it briefly. You mentioned the words Mercedes test, and I'd love to talk to you about that a little bit more. First of all, how did this come about? Who approached who? Well, it was it was all Toto. You know, when I was in my hospital bed in Bahrain, someone was helping me to open the things on my mobile phone because I didn't have any fingers to use. And then friends told me, oh, Toto says you could have a, a test in a Mercedes if you don't make it back to Abu Dhabi. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's, uh, you know, that that is super cool. Obviously, at the time, I really liked it, but I wanted to come back to Abu Dhabi uh, until the day it wasn't going to happen. And then I went back home, had a bit of recovery, 
And then eventually got um, got a call from Mercedes and um, says, okay, so um, here are the dates that we could do it. Seat fit will be on that date. Uh, you could do a little bit of simulator as well. And uh, how does that work for you? And are you up for it? I'm so bloody hell, of course I'm up for it. It's, you know, it is it is an incredible chance just for a few things. I am, I'm still a Formula One fan. I still watch the races. I've been driving it, but no, I get to drive the 2019 World Champion car, which at the end is not too far from the 2020, which was probably the fastest Formula One car ever built. And I drive it without pressure, you know, without having a test day to complete a few testings and go through a program and so on. And just, you know, yes, we can have a program, but it's more, let's go and have some fun. How hard are you going to push? 100%. Because <laughs> you it's the French Grand Prix weekend, isn't it? And you're doing some demo runs on Sunday morning. Are you tempted to try and go faster than the pole time, right? Well, yeah, yeah. what tyres will you have on it, actually? Will it be the Pirelli demo tyres? Uh, yeah, it will be the Pirelli demo tyres. So I guess that's going to, you know, that, that can always uh, play a bit. But I think, you know, at the, at the demo of the French Grand Prix, is more to... I guess, you know, it's going to be important for many people to see me in a Formula One car after what happened to me. You may have loved me. You may have, may have hate me. What happened to me, it was, you know, something you wish to no one. And I guess, you know, for myself, for my family, for my friends, seeing Romain back in a Formula One car, even for five laps of the French Grand Prix, it's going to be quite special. So I think that day is just going to be Hey guys, look, I'm here, I'm alive, I'm driving a Formula 1 car, I'm loving it. And Bahrain was a terrible day, but also probably one of the most positive experiences of my life. Well, oh, Greg, there's lots to ask you about there, that quote you've just come up with. But one final thing on the, on the Mercedes, what's the experience been like so far with the team? You talk about the seat fit and how different it is to any of your other F1 experiences. Well, I I got to the factory and I was amazed by the factory, the facilities, the way people are working around it. I mean, after I don't know five minutes within Mercedes uh, in Brackley, I could understand easily why they were the most successful sports team in history. I think you know, find another team, whatever sports that have been winning as much as Mercedes has done, it's, it's almost impossible. And therefore, getting in there, understanding, seeing it, understanding it, it, it is very clear. And uh, even though this year, everyone in Bahrain testing was like, oh yeah, Red Bull is faster, Red Bull is faster. Here we go, three races down and Mercedes two, Red Bull one. And that is the strength of that team. You know, even maybe they may not have the fastest car, but they will always find a solution around and you feel it when you're there. What do you feel? Is, is it the facilities? Is it the detail? Is it the culture? What stands out? I would say it, it is the culture at the top. And then from there, the details are pushed to a maximum. Um, everyone is really trying to get fine solution, get the, the solution to, to go faster. Obviously, the facilities are incredible. But I guess, you know, many teams can have the facilities but then it's just how you use it, how you optimize it. Have you had any contact with Lewis or Valtteri about how to drive the car, what to look out for? No, I haven't got uh, any yet. I guess they've been fairly busy fighting uh, cars, but uh, you know, I, I had a chance to get a few laps on the simulator and seems to be doing all right. So uh, I haven't forgotten how to race a car. My neck may, uh, may not be so happy, but uh, that's another story. How important is it for you to close your Formula One chapter driving a car like this? I would say it's the cherry on the cake. As I say, my chapter in Formula One has been over and, and many people texted me at the first race of the season. Oh, it must be hard to watch and so on. I'm like, no, it, it's actually cool. You know, I'm enjoying watching the race. There's a good fight between uh, Max and Lewis. Who is going to win? Uh, it's quite exciting. The midfield is super tight. I'm happy watching it and I don't have, you know, any hard feeling for it because as I say, my chapter, I feel is it's like done, but obviously having an extra day on a car like the Mercedes for fun, for myself, that is incredible. It's going to be very special. And we're going to come on to more F1 2021 in a minute. You said something that surprised me a moment ago when you said what happened in Bahrain was a positive experience. What do you mean by that? 
100%. And I may sound crazy, but let me explain. Every day I, I leave since then is like a bonus day. I'm relieved to tell you that I'm hearing that Roman Grosjean is out of the car and that is a big sigh of relief in this comp box and I'm sure where you are watching because that was unlike anything we've seen in a very long time. Instant flames in the wall. And I was so close from not being here anymore that it makes you realize how beautiful life is. Yes, you know, you may have small issues here and there and, you know, a connecting flight being cancelled or losing time and, you know, uh, things you would moan about. And well, I still moan a little bit about it. But also, every morning I wake up, I need to remove my uh, my silicon gloves and then I put some cream in my hands and I remember that I am alive. I'm here. I can play with my kids. I can go racing again. I've got my lovely wife next to me. I'm up here in life just because I've realized how good life is even with his problems you know and it was it would be quite boring if we didn't have any issues in life and you know it, it is it is quite yeah crazy to think that I had to be so close from from not being here anymore to realize actually that life is not not free it's it has to be has to be lived have you re-watched the accident with your family with your kids with your wife yeah the uh, the kids asked um they had many questions so I've been watching it with, with my kids, with my wife. You know, I can talk about it very openly. I've worked with the psychologist after it um, just to make sure there were no flashback or nightmares or anything bad coming from it. I'm the first one to joke about it, you know, saying I'm a hard one to cook, we say in French, and uh, meaning that you're quite uh, resistant. And uh, as I say, you know, it, it, it has changed my life, um, but for the better. You say you've worked with a sports psychologist. That was actually something you've done for a while as well, isn't it, during your career? But has there been any delayed shock? Does it keep you awake at night? Do you have flashbacks? No, I had, uh, had a couple of flashbacks and a phase in the accident that I needed to understand to go through with uh, my psychologist. But um, a couple of flashbacks. One was quite early morning, 6 a.m. I think one of my son woke me up. And the other one was when I was going to the um, the surgery for my hands back in Geneva, just before being put asleep. So I guess the, all the, the ingredients were there to not make you feel good and, and remind you what Bahrain Hospital looked like from the bed. So there were a the couple of flashbacks I had, but since then, no, never had a nightmare. Can watch it without any problem. I uh, can talk about it without any problem. And yes, you know, my hand is... It's not great. I can go on the sun. I need to be careful with cold temperature, with sudden sun, hot temperature, and so on. But um, but also it's working. Uh, I can play with my kids. I can still build uh, Lego. And um, that's what matters. You've talked already about your passion for racing. Can you just clarify, have you at any point thought about giving up race driving? No. I may, I may, have, may have mentioned it, to friends family parents to make them feel better but there were never a point where I, I thought about quitting racing you know the first the first target was Abu Dhabi the last Grand Prix of the season and then when that was not going to happen it was the deadline of the 31st of January that I wanted to be able to use my hand properly to go back testing and, and racing in IndyCar and it was never an option even though some people try to push me there. Did your wife, at any, was she one of those people? Or is, is Marion being a great supporter? Whatever you want to do, husband, you do it. She's, she has been an incredible support. And uh, also my kids that initially wanted me to stop, uh, they actually came around quite nicely. And even Simon, my second son, five years old, he asked me, he said, Daddy, when are you going to do the, the circuit that turns round and round and round? I said, oh, the ovals. So yeah, I want you. I want to see you there. I think they understand that it makes me happy that I'm enjoying my life because I get to race, and that uh, fulfill myself. So when I'm home, I'm a better dad. And you were very wise because I saw that you went on a road trip with the family in an RV. So the kids had a great time. Where did you go? It was just before the first race, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So uh, when I'm in the US, I live in an RV, which is which is an incredible adventure. I am absolutely loving it. It's got my bicycle, my gaming computer, 
all my clothes. So when you see me traveling from Europe to the States, I'm traveling with a backpack. Literally, like I would go to Paris for a day, you know, just for the day, not even. Uh, and I've got all my stuff there. And so we started in Miami and then we did all the East Coast of Florida, quite short distance every day, an hour and a half, two hours drive. And uh, went up, yeah, went to Na Neza, uh, Cap Canaveral. Then we went to St. Augustine, which was the first city built in the US. Then to Savannah and then towards Atlanta. And uh, I dropped them at the drop off at the airport with the RV. So, cars move, I'm coming. <laughs> and uh, put them there and then carry on uh, to, uh, to Alabama uh, to get race one. But it's uh, the kids, they absolutely do want to to leave uh, the RV. The RV life. Yeah, uh, they just they just want to come. There's like, when are we coming back? It's like July, July. How big? Roman, Roman how big is this thing? Because five of you, I'm guessing, is quite cramped or not? It's a bit scary at first. So it's, uh, it's 42 feet, which is about 18 meters. It weighs about 56,000 pounds, which is 20 tons. And guess what? My driving license is good enough to drive it. The red car driving license. Did you really? Oh my goodness, yes. that's nuts! Um, and of course, it's one of those ones that expands sideways. I suppose when you park it up. Did you do the RV thing in Formula One? I did not. I tried once and I didn't like it. But I, I guess when it's you know that one is is following me everywhere, so I can leave all my my clothes in there. And I, I understand that you you enjoy it. But also in IndyCar, out of twenty four drivers, I, I reckon we are fourteen to twenty to have RVs. So we all park next, next to each other. Everyone helps each other. There's barbecues in the evening. There's a cool atmosphere. Is it more friendly among the drivers than Formula One? Yeah. And I, I, I don't know why, because I'm sure drive, Formula One drivers, you know, are, are super cool guys. But for some reason, the, apart from, I would say, Daniel and, um, and Lando last year, it's been a bit more complicated to get relation. Uh, whilst down there, it was very open. And even, you know, you know one of the first time I spoke with Colton Erta, we were mentioning him earlier, I said, why are you guys not weaving in the safety car to warm the tires up? He looked at me and says, it's, it's pointless, it doesn't work, the track are bumpy, there's marbles, so just use brake and throttle at the same time, that will do. I'm like, okay, okay, you know, I would well, never have had the advice in Formula One, but here it is. And, and it, was, it wasn't duff advice, it was genuine advice. It was genuine advice, that's what they do and that's what I do and it works. And there are quite a few Formula One expats in IndyCar now. Uh, alongside yourself, who have you got? Sebastian Borde. You've got Takuma Sato. Tell me, help me out here, Roman. Who else is there? Marcus Ericsson. Marcus Ericsson, of course. Alexander Rossi. Yes. So quite a few and uh, different reason, you know, uh, some, as, as I say, some super quick driver and some other driver like Scott Dixon. I think he went there for a year initially and that was 2003, if I'm not mistaken. And... Um, He's on 214 season or so in Indica. And he's sort of won races in every season or for the last 19 seasons or something ridiculous, hasn't he? Something ridiculous. Yeah. Wow, what an amazing adventure you're on, Roman. And it's so infectious, uh, your enthusiasm for it. But can we just talk a little bit about F1 2021? The cars this year look a little bit edgier with the, the aero changes that have been made. Do you think they look harder to drive than what you had last year? It's a good question. I can't really answer that directly. I think the rules were, I mean, it's been, it's been a bit open, so I can say it, but the rules were made to slow down Mercedes, which in all fairness is a good thing because this season, the fight at the front, it's absolutely great to watch. Yes, the car do, do look a little bit more on the edge, a little bit more tricky from the rear end. Not necessarily the slower cars, but more the top teams that we used to see really stable and so on. Though they um, they do uh, slide a bit more, but it's actually quite cool to see. As I say, I was watching every everything and um, seeing Lando Norris with the McLaren being purple sector one and two in Imola is something in Q3. So it's not like it's Q1 and you know some of the top guys are slow. Something you would never have seen in the last few years, and you know that that is exciting. I remember asking you in the press conference last year, what kind of car are Nikita Mazepin and Mick Schumacher inheriting from you and Kevin? And you said it's a benign car. It's pretty easy to drive. Yet we've seen them have their issues, spins and so forth. What kind of a job do you think those two guys are doing for Haas? It's hard to tell. I think they obviously they haven't been given the best tool and 
in in racing, you know, you may do a good lap, but when you see that the car in front of you is a second faster because it's a faster car, you're going to try to get that second. And therefore, that's where you start driving 110% instead of 100 and things can get a little bit um, sketchy. Obviously, we've seen a couple of mistakes from, from them. But again, they uh, they must be trying to stay with the pack to catch up. You know, the car it doesn't look that different from, uh, from last year. And um, I think it's just not a good enough car for to fight for good position. Well, let's talk about the front now. How excited are you about Lewis Hamilton versus Max Verstappen? Well, I mean, this is this is mega. This is so good to watch. I watched Bahrain and after the race, I must say I was very impressed with Lewis' race. You know, he, he has had some easy one in the last few years. But that one in Bahrain, that is why Lewis has been world champion. That's why he's been winning the way he won in junior categories. That's why we came to Formula One. He could compete with Fernando Alonso straight away. That was very nice to see. We know Max is always pushing as hard as he can. And, you know, in Portugal again, getting the fastest lap in the race, but then just over exceeding track limit and losing it and so on. But you can tell he's, he's there and he's pushing. And it's cool to see. Uh, I would say the next three, four races, Barcelona, everyone know it. But then you go to Baku, Turkey, uh, Monaco, and they are they are a bit different tracks, and I think that's where possibly one or the other could could take a bit of a an edge. Talking of edge, you've raced both of these guys. If there's one thing about Lewis Hamilton that stands out, what is it? He doesn't make mistakes. Very rarely, he made one in, in Imola, but then recovered quite nicely from it. But generally. Even when it, there are tricky conditions, you know, Turkey last year was a good example on the wet when Valtteri had a bit of a nightmare afternoon spinning around. Lewis stayed on track and got and clinched his uh, seven world title and didn't make mistake. That is one thing that I, we must admit is that Lewis very rarely make a, a mistake that, uh, that is costly. You know, it, he spins. It may crash in free practice. That happens to all of us. But whenever it's it's go time, he's there. And he's fair. Has he ever pushed you off the track or done the dirty on you? No, true. I mean, every time we raced, it's been you know quite quite good to race. There, there were a few guys on the grid that I knew that I, when I was racing them, I knew it was going to be a, a nice one. You know, uh, Kimi, uh, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis, definitely Daniel Ricciardo. Those guys, you knew you could have a good fight and um, it was always going to be nice. Saying that, when Lewis passed Max in Portimao and Max tried the outside in turn two, Lewis didn't give much room, which is what you do when you're inside, you know. But you can tell that Lewis, you know, he's like, yeah, well, you know what? I got that position. You're not going to have it straight back. What about Max? If there's one thing that stands out about him, what is it? The fact that from lap one to lap check it flag of the Grand Prix is always flat out. From free practice to the end of the race, he's always really pushing it and finding the way to go fast. You know, even when his teammates may be struggling a little bit, you will never see Max struggle. He would always find a way to get his lap time. Does he need to change his approach in any way to get the better of Lewis Hamilton? Arguably, you could say that in Portugal he had pole position and the fastest lap, but again. I like it. He pushes it, puts some gravel or some, some grass outside of the track, and then we won't hear about track limits. That's something I really like about the US. That's not a question that you ask yourself. And uh, I feel like, uh, you know, there's been a bit too much talk about that. Monsieur Grosjean, I need to correct you there. When you go to Kota in an Indy car, you are going to run so wide between turns 19 and 20 you're going to create a whole new piece of racetrack. Have you seen footage from what they do there? I did, and it was absolutely ridiculous. And they realized it, and that's why they're not going there anymore. (laughs) Okay, there's no race in Kota this year. I mean, they only went there once, and because it was a bit of a shit show, they they decided they wasn't it. And it's not, it's a beautiful track. I mean, I, in Formula One, incredible. In an IndyCar, it doesn't quite work. It's too wide, it's too fast, it's too open. And that's why I say, you know, the cars are very different. A track that is absolutely outstanding for a Formula One car, 
like Suzuka, Kota, just wouldn't work that well on an Indy car because the downforce is not there. The car is a bit heavier. It's a bit less agile, but it's good over bumps, over curves, over up and down crest, low speed corners and, and stuff like that. Now, uh, back to Formula One. Which driver and team has surprised you this year? Actually, there hasn't been any surprise. The one I was expecting to be there are there. There's been a bit some disappointment with Alpha Tori dropping a little bit. Obviously, Aston Martin that I could see better. Ferrari, I knew they were coming back. McLaren, I knew they were going to be good. And Lando is doing a great job. And I'm sure Daniel is, is going to get there very soon. It's good to see Fernando back in, in Formula One and, uh, you know, being hungry. Oh, he was good in Portugal on Sunday, wasn't he? That was as good a race as I've ever seen him do. Yeah, no, he loved it. He loved it. You know, he was he was up there and he was pushing and you can tell he's, he's enjoying it. So really there hasn't been any, any, I mean, the first few races was Yuki Tsunoda. I'm a big fan of Yuki Tsunoda. But since that spin in Q1 in, in Imola, it's been a bit, you know, I mean, it's, it's normal uh, in Formula One. But let's see. Oh, he bounces back and uh, I want to see Yuki at the front because I just I just like his, his approach. Have you been surprised by Norris's pace relative to Ricardo so far? Yes, uh, as well as I think Leclerc and Sainz is a bit the same thing, at least in quality. But I think after four, five, six races, the new drivers in the team would find a solution. You know, We're only talking three tenths of a second, which is huge in motor racing. But if you take a clock and you say three tenths of a second, it's no much. And I think Daniel, we, as he had with Renault, we found, you know, that, that little something to go faster in the car. Same with Sainz and same with Fernando, that he was the first one to admit that he wasn't quite where he wanted to be. So um, let's see. Brilliant. Just a couple more questions. Sprint qualifying race. What do you think? Well, that, that's where I've changed my cap. I, I used to absolutely be against it just because when I was a racing driver in Formula One, and thought it wasn't good. No, as a fan from the outside, I'm like, well, let's give it a go. I just hope the weekend is not going to be too complicated to understand and change the rules, you know, with the, the qualifying Friday and then the free practice Saturday morning again and then the race. Saturday. I just hope it's not going to be too complicated to watch, but it's also quite exciting. Do you like the idea of qualifying on a Friday? I don't mind it. I, I think less free practice is a good idea. George Russell, will he be a worthy successor is he a worthy successor to the GPDA director role taking over from you? Yeah, it's good to have George uh, managing, being with Sebastian and the GPDA. I'm still in, in contact with them. You know, I'm still part of it as a, a no member. Really? Are you, are you, you talk, what, safety issues, stuff like that? Yeah, safety issues, few things. You know, I, I am, we have a WhatsApp group, so I'm still in there. Still giving my feedback also from my outside window. No, I'm not into the... I can watch it from outside and you see things slightly different, which is good asset to have. And uh, I think George was the right guy. You know, we, we needed a, a youngster to be on board, to bring his new ideas, his new vision, you know, between Sebastian and George is what, 10, 15 years difference, which uh, on track is not much, but uh, in life it's, uh, it's a bit and generation. Have you stayed in contact with many of the drivers? Uh, not that much, to be fair. I was a bit disappointed that not many took uh, news about how I was recovering after Bahrain, and uh, it's been a bit a bit disappointing in that in that way. But um, hey, we we all have a life, and everyone was busy practicing his training, his neck, and practicing and spending time with family. Um, but it would have been nice to have a little bit more, few more messages. So, Roman, it's been great to chat. And to see you looking so well. And I've got one more question scribbled down on a bit of paper in front of me. And that is, how long do you think you're going to race on? I think a long time. <laughs> but don't say that to my wife. <laughs> but it, it's a second youngs that I, I find in the... I'm a rookie, so maybe I feel 20 again. Do you feel energized? That's a really good point. Do you feel energized learning something new? Yeah, energized. The challenge is, is good, it's difficult, but also I can, you know, I can see myself winning races and that is what I need to carry on because winning is what I love. Is there any other aspect of the sport, any other job within the sport that interests you after driving 10 years hence or whenever? Possibly, you know, again, I haven't really thought about it in details because I haven't thought about stopping racing yet. 
a lot of motorsport generally, I think I understand a bit of it. And uh, surely there'll be, there'll be a seat for me somewhere. Oh, Roman, of course. Well, look, thank you so much for your time. And good luck. When's the next race in the US? Uh, we're racing on the 15th of May in Indianapolis GP. Oh, of course. That's the weekend before the 500, isn't it? Or... Uh, two weeks before the 500, yes. Well, look, best of luck with that. And thanks again for your time. It's been really good to chat. Thank you. How fantastic was it to hear from Roman? His take on things is so interesting. And I don't know about you, but I had to pick up my jaw from the floor at various moments. To hear him say the accident in Bahrain has changed his life for the better is nothing short of extraordinary. And of course, it was great to hear him talk so enthusiastically about that upcoming test with Merck. He's really looking forward to it, and so he should. It will be a wonderful way for him to close his driving career in Formula One. Roman, it was great to hear from you. Thanks for your time. And I look forward to seeing you at Paul Ricard, no doubt, when you'll have a massive smile on your face. Before we move on, please remember to send in any stories or chance meetings or thoughts that you have on Roman. And remember, I'll read out the best ones next week. Send them to me at Tom Clarkson F1 or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings me on to what you sent in about Monisha Kaltenborn after last week's show. Jezza F said, really interesting to hear from Monisha. I had no idea she'd climbed her way through the company to team principal. It can be done. Indeed, it can, Jezza. And not only at Sauber, Stefano Domenicali, now the big boss of Formula One, climbed his way through the ranks at Ferrari to team principal. Nula got in touch with a very simple message which read, I want to be Monisha. Well, Nula, as Monisha proved, if you chase your dreams and work hard enough, you can achieve whatever you want. And we'll end with this from Bean87, who said, loved hearing Monisha talk about that 2012 season with Kamui and Checo. As far as I'm concerned, that was Sauber's golden era. Well, nice one, Bean. It was certainly a great season and Monisha clearly enjoyed looking back, didn't she? As ever, we got loads of messages, and I'm sorry if I didn't read yours out, but please know that I've read each and every one of them. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Roman again, and remember to send in your thoughts and stories about him. As ever, I'll be back next week with another great guest from the world of F1. So see you then. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.